It is uh, my pleasure to be uh, able to uh, welcome Rebecca Free back to the Old Guard. Becky spoke with us in September of 2019. At that time, she took us on a trip through the New Jersey Pine Barrens, explaining its ecology, human history, and the threats to its survival. Today, she will discuss the importance of the pine lands to New Jersey and our environment, along with describing the never-ending fight to keep the pine lands from being overrun by developers. Becky is the Director of Membership and Communications for the Pinelands Preservation Alliance, the PPA. She grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and even worked as a seasonal park ranger at Big Bend National Park in Texas. She earned a master's degree from Texas A&M in their highly regarded parks, tourism, and recreation department. Becky has been with the Pinelands Preservation Alliance since 2007. When she is not working to uh, save the Pinelands, she's playing sports with her sons or training as a power lifter. Becky tells me that she can deadlift 300 pounds. I guess you need to be tough to fight off those Jersey developers. <laughs> Becky, thank, thank you so much for returning to the Old Guard and describing the good work being done in the Pinelands. The uh, Zoom microphone and stage are yours. Thank you so much, Steve, for the introduction. And I really want to thank everybody for the invitation. Um, it's always a pleasure to speak with the Old Guard. There are so many members who are so active, caring for your community, caring for the environment, and taking action on behalf of others. Um, so I really enjoy this opportunity. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm pleased to be here. And though I wish we could be in person, it's a shorter drive for me to walk to my kitchen. So I appreciate that. Um, I love every minute of working for the Pinelands Preservation Alliance. I have been here for a long time now. And I think the one thing that matters to me the most is the fact that we collaborate with others, other groups like Environment New Jersey, um, but we're not afraid to take a chance, especially on behalf of the Pinelands. And I want to tell you a little bit about what we do, because we've been, um, we have some new projects that I think you'll be interested in. Um, this picture here shows you where we're located. We are in Southampton, New Jersey. So we are just outside the um, western border of the Pinelands. And the barn in that picture was constructed on our property in 1932. It was a catalog barn, so it was shipped flat to Mount Holly and picked up by horse and wagon and then constructed on site. Our location at the Bishop Farmstead is actually on the National and State Historic Register. The farmhouse was constructed in 1753 and the barn is a contributing structure to that designation. We have taken a lot of effort and raised a lot of money to um, stabilize the barn and make it usable. I think many of you know that uh, historic structures, we really lose those over time if there aren't groups and individuals invested in their use. And so this barn we now are able to use for symposiums and lectures, talks, and we even have an arrangement to host weddings at the farmstead, which helps generate unrestricted income for the work that we do, and in particular supports our education programs through Pinelands Adventures. So Pinelands Adventures is another project of the Pinelands Preservation Alliance. And I heard your kayak report and canoeing report. Um, you know, it's critical for the Pinelands to be protected in the state of New Jersey, that people have this opportunity to experience the Pinelands and really understand how special it is. These places in our state won't remain protected unless people love them and they love them enough to take action on their behalf. In 2015, Wayne Adams, who had owned uh, Wayne Adams Canoe Rental in the heart of the Pinelands was really trying to get out of the canoeing business. It is a difficult business. It's hard on the body. There's a lot of physical work and it, is a, it was an all hands on deck effort for his family. So we had discussions with Wayne and were able to raise money to purchase the, the Wayne Adams Canoe Rental business. And now since then, we've been able to grow that business. We offer self-guided canoe and kayak trips. 
on the Mullica and the Batstow River. This is a picture of the Mullica here. Um, and you can see that in this picture, it always makes an impression on me because to me, you honestly could be in Maine, you could be in Vermont, you could be in Southern Canada. And this is here in the Pinelands in New Jersey, which is the most densely packed state in the nation. Um, an, a critical element of Pinelands Adventures that we raise money for from individuals and foundations is to provide the opportunity for schools and community groups who can't have access to the Pine Barrens. Perhaps they live too far away and transportation is too expensive. Perhaps they can't afford the cost of the program. Perhaps they didn't even really envision or imagine that the Pinelands exist where they're afraid of canoeing. And so we make a great deal of effort through outreach and through fundraising to provide that opportunity. Of course, it's been difficult during COVID. We've had to suspend our programs, but we are um, able to do canoe rentals safely. And we're just beginning to relaunch some guided programs. So members of the public could take a trip with a naturalist down a section of the river. Um, and that program continues to grow. We've had about 30,000 people come through to take a trip in the Pinelands from New York, from Pennsylvania, from all across the country. Um, so it's really been a great thing to see happen. And then there's this new effort we have. The Rancocas Creek Farm was launched in 2019. Like I said, our farmstead where we're located was originally 11 acres and it was part of property that had been 400 acres that was, I will, I'll put in quotes, purchased from the Native Americans in the area by three Quaker families who then split the land between them and built that farmhouse in 1753. Well, the owner of about 70 acres that basically encircled our property in a U shape was looking for somebody to take ownership of the property. It had been farmed by somebody who rented the property, but she was looking to see more done with it and donated this entire 70 acres to the Pinelands Preservation Alliance. It's in the Preserve Farmland Program. One of our major efforts as an organization is to protect um, water quality and water quantity. And one of the problems we always knew about this property, which was right at the corner of where we're located, is that water runs off in big storms, which are more frequent these days, into the Rancocas Creek, which is a Pinelands Creek that arises in the Pinelands and flows to the Delaware. So here was this amazing opportunity for us to um, take steps to mitigate stormwater runoff. And we did that by planting over 1,100 trees and shrubs on the property in the wettest areas that sort of run through the center. And then we were able to raise enough money to hire staff and begin a chemical-free farm and sustainable farm process on this property. And it was conventionally farmed. It was 70 acres of soybeans. So there was very little plant diversity and wildlife was not nearly as noticeable as it is now. Now we have all kinds of amazing birds. It has become quite the birding spot. If you use eBird, you'll find us on there. And you'll see that Dick Sissel, which is a bird that is typically much further south, has made a home here, as well as grasshopper sparrows, which are hard to find these days. Um, you know, some people have wondered if this was too far off the beaten path for us, since our mission is to protect and preserve the natural and the historical resources of the Pine Barrens. But agriculture is the biggest industry in and around New Jersey's Pine Barrens. Blueberries and cranberries are native crops that grow here. And it really is um, it, an essential element of how we are the garden state. Agriculture has big impacts on water quality and quantity. And so for us, we've been able to now make partnerships with farmers. We are also, moving forward in the demonstration that you can farm sustainably in a way that involves community um, and protect water quality and in fact improve habitat. Um, 2020 was the first year we tried to launch the farm and as all of us know it was an incredibly difficult year for people across the nation. Thanks to the Princeton Area Community Foundation who established a COVID-19 relief and recovery fund we were able to receive some grant money and then the food that we were growing since we couldn't invite the public to come to the farm was donated to soup kitchens and local area um, distributors of food to people in need. 
And we actually grew over 15,000 pounds of food that were distributed during that year. This year, our farm season is uh, a CSA, so people buy a share and come once a week to pick up food from the farm and get to see how their food is grown, bring their children. But we also are growing food that's donated to an amazing organization, which I would encourage you to invite to have as a speaker called New Jersey Farmers Against Hunger. They're part of the New Jersey Agricultural Society and their goal is to involve the public in gleaning food from farms that participate and then donate that fresh food and produce to soup kitchens. We know that people in need who depend on soup kitchens and churches and the like frequently have pre-packaged soups and cans and all of those things that do help, but the access to fresh produce is severely limited. And so uh, we are happy and proud that we are able to continue to tr contribute to this effort. So let's talk about the pine lands or the pine barrens. You'll hear me refer to them variously in the same way. And I'll explain the difference um, as we move forward. So if you haven't been to the pine barrens, um, I highly encourage you to get out there. It is truly wilderness in the most densely populated state in the nation. It's also the largest surviving open space on the eastern seaboard between the forests of Maine and the Florida Everglades. In fact, if you look at some recent pictures that NASA has shared of the United States at night and you look at the East Coast, it is absolutely remarkable to see that outline of the Pine Barrens is this dark spot in a completely recognizable state of New Jersey. There are plants and animals here that you can't find anywhere else in the world. In fact, there is a plant called the bog asphodel with a gorgeous yellow flower that as far as scientists know is only found now here in New Jersey's Pine Barrens. And for those of you who are interested and know a little bit about our native frogs, the Pine Barrens tree frog, which is really the iconic species in the Pine Barrens, it has its great, greatest chance of survival here in New Jersey. It can be found in other locations along the East Coast, but it's losing habitat rapidly because those areas do not have the protections that we have here in the Pine Lands. And, you know, I think one thing that we have all learned and continue to learn is that right now with the impacts of COVID-19, having outdoor resources, whether it's for you yourself being able to take a walk and leave your house, especially during uh, 2020 in particular, or a place where like I met my mom at a park and I hadn't been able to see her in about six months. And we were able to talk to each other and walk next to each other and be outside. And in, there is nothing I can think of that I have ever experienced that really demonstrated the physical and mental health elements that are related to open space and how critical it is that we have places and we protect places that people can visit, explore, and enjoy. And the Pine Barrens to me is really this great example of the struggle between being needing to use the land for our homes, for our businesses, for our economic survival, and needing to protect the land because we need clean water and clean air, and we need to really work to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So the Pine Barrens has these amazing communities. It has a lot of pitch pine forests. There are a lot of oak trees that are found in the Pine Barrens. So it has these sort of higher dry areas. And then we also have what we refer to as the lowlands. So there are areas with Atlantic white cedar trees, which kind of soar up very straight towards the sky, but they like to grow in some wetter areas. There are swamps and bogs, which are full of muck and mystery. And then we have these open spaces along these rivers in the Pine Barrens that have orchids and plants that you can't see anywhere else. And in fact, you might only see them if you take a canoe down a Pine Barrens River. And then the water. The water is just one of the most important elements of this whole ecosystem. When we think about New Jersey's pine lands or pine barrens, we often think of it specifically in the state of New Jersey and as this unique resource for our state, but really it's part of the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens ecoregion. It is a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, the Pinelands National Reserve in New Jersey, because it's the best example we can find of this ecosystem. But you see that we have pine barrens up off Long Island. There is a Long Island Pine Barrens Society that is working to protect 
their little uh, smidgen of pine barrens. But as you can see, it has really been impacted by development where you see the red color there in, in Long Island. I'll bring my mouse over right here. And then up in Massachusetts and Cape Cod, there are um, several examples, fine examples of pine barrens. But on this map with the blue circle, clearly the largest example is here in New Jersey. And it's the best protected because of regulations that we'll talk about later. There are also isolated spots as you move down the coast. Um, in West Virginia, Wisconsin, Virginia, New Hampshire, you can have these experiences of hiking. I was in um, Newfoundland years ago and I was hiking through sphagnum swamps and I was just blown away by how I felt like I was in New Jersey. So there are three elements to the Pine Barrens that really sort of define its appearance. And the first is soil. Everything arises from the soil. If you are gardening up in Summit or um, doing some work outside, I would guess that your soil is likely much more organic. It's darker in color. It probably holds on to and filters water a little better, at least in some areas. But in the Pine Barrens, we have very sandy soil. It is sand like you see at the beach. And as you know, water goes through that sand very quickly. So it is, can be incredibly dry. Plants that grow in the Pine Barrens have to be able to grow in dry conditions unless they're in a swamp area. It also has incredibly low nutrients. So it doesn't hold on to carbon-based material at all. Um, so plants have to be able to grow despite that fact. And then the soil and the water in the Pine Barrens is incredibly acidic. It is between three and a half to 5.5. So you can see on my scale over here, that's you know somewhere between orange juice and black coffee. So that is pretty acidic water. And yet the water is incredibly clean. It does create a barrier, you know, plants and animals that can live in the Pine Barrens have a great arrangement because those plants and animals we would find outside that boundary typically cannot deal with the acidity that you find here. And then water. So water in the Pine Barrens, like I said earlier, is absolutely critical, crucial. In fact, some of you may know the story of Joseph Wharton of Wharton, Wharton Business School. He was a speculator in the Pine Barrens, a landowner. He um, owned much of what became Wharton State Forest, which is New Jersey's largest state protected area at 125,000 acres. Um, he also lived in Philadelphia and water quality in Philadelphia was terrible. And the plan in Joseph Wharton's mind was to find ways to run canals and systems that would bring water from the Pine Barrens into Philadelphia. And this was one of the things that prompted the state to actually take action and pass regulations that water could not be exported more than 10 miles outside the boundary of the Pine Barrens. The water in the Pine Barrens is incredibly vulnerable because it is the water at the surface. The picture you see here of the kayaker, that is uh, Batstow Lake, that is within Wharton State Forest. That is the aquifer. An aquifer, if you don't know, is this area of water that's typically underground that we drill our well into in order to have drinking water, for example. But in the Pine Barrens, that water is both beneath the surface and at the surface. It's as if you had a bucket of sand that was saturated and you ran your finger through the top of that, creating a divot and the water sort of floods in and then disappears. That's what we have here in the Pine Barrens. The aquifer here, it provides water, drinking water to about a million people. It is a critical source of water, especially to the barrier islands and along the coast. Um, so it is a very important resource and it's vulnerable because it's easy to draw it down and it is easy to contaminate. If you know anything about the Pine Barrens, you know it from the news and you probably know wildfire. We hear about wildfire from time to time. This ecosystem depends on fire to survive. It was historically a force that occurred naturally from lightning strikes that um, allow the pine barrens to remain dominated by these pitch pine trees. Pitch pine trees need fire to open their cones and release their seeds. In fact, they're designed to survive in these circumstances. In this day and age, with the number of people who live in and around the pine barrens, of course, we can't let wildfires start nor spread. And so what the state of New Jersey does is try to do prescribed burning, but they're typically done in colder weather. 
that is for safety and it's 100% understandable. Unfortunately, it does cause some ecological impacts where over time, we will likely see more oak trees in the pine barrens than pitch pine trees, which sort of caught, which will cause a change in the type of ecosystem we see. There are other ways to keep the pine barrens sort of where it should be if natural forces were in effect, but fire had been, you know, certainly the best natural influence. And this is just a little picture that shows you how adapted the pine barrens are. This is an area that burned, and this is about a month later. <clears throat> In the picture on the left, you see the sprouting here. So pitch pine trees will sprout new growth from their base. They also, in the upper right, it's called epicormic sprouting. They will start to regrow right from the trunk. You can also see the pine cones here that are open and how it is sprouting from the base. So when a fire comes through, it's causing the pine cones to open and drop seed, but it's also adding organic content, carbon, through the burned material. And so it does create this unique system where pitch pine trees can continue to grow and survive. So the pine barrens. You know, this, this image here is one of my favorite images. It's from the state of New Jersey's archives, and it's of Brendan Burns signing the Pinelands Protection Act of 1979. All the movement to protect the Pinelands had almost, I would say, always been an element of its history. There were botanists in the 1800s that spent time out here discovering plants like the curly grass bird. And there were explorers and uh, all sorts of scientists over the years who knew how valuable it was. But really, the movement kicked off in the mid-1960s when there was a proposal to build a supersonic jet port that had also been pr proposed in the Great Swamp area. Once that was turned down, it came to the Pine Barrens and there were people with, who lived within the Pine Barrens boundaries who wanted to see a supersonic jet port built and a huge city. But that proposal was really what galvanized the movement of scientists, of um, politicians, of nonprofit groups and other experts to find a way to protect this area. People knew that water was very vulnerable. People knew that there were incredible species of plants and animals that they didn't seem to see elsewhere. But people lived here, they farmed here, they grew crops here. There were all sorts of industries like charcoal and uh, a, a timber industry and a floral industry here. So how would this get protected? During this period of time, uh, the National Park Service was involved and did several studies. Could we create a national monument? Could we create a national park? And both of those ideas were essentially thrown out after reports were done because it would involve using eminent domain and uh, essentially people losing their homes in this huge boundary of about a million acres. What happens is, you know, Senator Florio played a, a big role in sponsoring the national parks, the national parks and recreation legislation in 1978 at the federal level. So this legislation created our country's first national reserve, and that was the Pinelands National Reserve. This also ordered the state of New to do a few things. They had to create a body called the Pinelands Commission that would be an independent state agency to oversee how the rules were implemented in this area. They had to create a, a plan, a smart growth plan. Where were you going to build? Where were you going to protect? And how are you going to do it? How are you going to compensate people who were going to lose some of the rights to develop their land? And then creating an independent body or commission to oversee the work of this agency called the Pinelands Commission. And so that's, that's what happened when Brendan Burns signed the Pinelands Protection Act in 1979. So the Pinelands Commission is, I would argue, the most important body that makes decisions related to the Pinelands. They really have the opportunity, although they have not been doing a good job of it lately, to keep the pinelands protected, to improve protection, and to make it possible for people to continue to sort of balance their needs and the needs of the environment. It's a 15-member body. There's one member at the federal level from the Secretary of Interior. There are seven from the counties that make up the pinelands. So that would be Atlanta County, Burlington County, Camden County, Cape May County, Gloucester, Cumberland, and Ocean. And then 
And so that makes you, and then the governor also nominates seven people. If you follow our work, you know that we are extremely frustrated with all of those levels. And we'll talk about that in a little, a little bit. And then they established the comprehensive management plan. So this was a years long effort to look at the ecology of the Pine Barrens, to go out in the community, to do stakeholder meetings and to determine the best way to protect the Pine Barrens. You'll see a variety of colors here. In the green in the center, let's see, I'll move my mouse here. This, this green here in the center, this is the preservation area. It has the highest level of protection. Um, and it is critical that these areas get protected for their resources. Some of the other colors would represent forest areas. So there's different types of development that can happen in forest area, but the density is very low. As you get into the lighter colors, so your oranges and yellows, those are areas where development is permitted. And you know, the basic premise is that development is permitted on the outskirts to varying degrees, but it's the interior that's protected. One of the challenges of this plan is it was created before we really understood how watersheds worked. So there are elements and places in the Pine Barrens where perhaps greater protection is needed because of the way water flows through the system. And part of our job is advocating for those cha challenges or changes rather. So that just to show you here, so when I say Pine Lands, I am referring to actually the political boundary. That's this dark green line here in the green sort of blob on the left. There is a section related to protecting the Pine Barrens that is in the blue there, and that is what we call the CAFRA overlap. So that is the Coastal Area Facilities Review Act, and that is the Department of Environmental Protection. So they're overseeing the areas that head towards the coast and the bay in collaboration with the Pinelands Commission. When you look at the ecological Pine Barrens, that's your red color on the right side of your screen, you'll see that the Pine Barrens itself extended much farther than they're actually protected historically. Um, but this boundary, the green boundary for the Pinelands National Reserve is a million acres. And there you go. So that's on the inside. It shows you what's actually protected. So one of the, uh, I think, most important facts to um, consider is what does it look like now with these rules in effect? And this image shows you, um, it shows you the impact of the plan. So the red is urban and suburban development. And then some of the purples, although I know it is a little bit hard to tell, but those are on the inside here is farmland. And then you see this, uh, you see blue for wetlands and green for forests. Permanently preserved land in the Pine Barrens has more than doubled since the Comprehensive Management Plan came into effect in 1980, which is far more than the rest of the state combined. So if it wasn't for hard boundaries and restrictions, uh, land would have been too expensive and too fragmented by development for this to even be possible. And this is an example, a real life example, um, that is a little bit more, uh, that's a little easier to, to grasp. And this shows you a hard boundary. This is a development um, on the eastern side of the Pine Barrens and where you see the housing stop quite literally moves directly into forest. If we don't have good strong rules that are implemented fairly, no matter who's governor, no matter who's in power, then we do, will run into trouble as we see um, a slow fragmenting of the protected areas in the Pine Barrens. So we have all this great all these great rules. And we also do have a history where these rules have really honestly worked to protect areas. But we at the Pinelands Preservation Alliance and with our partner organizations throughout the state are very concerned that since we have moved now long past the pressure to protect the Pinelands, that we have lost the political will to protect this area and to stand up for it. Um, when you don't have strong leaders in state government who are invested in seeing this area protected, who understand the importance of having good leaders at the Pinelands Commission, then you really run into some trouble. You have a failure of funding and you have a failure of the ability to implement your rules across the board, no matter who is asking for permission. Pipelines in the Pinelands is an example of this. And I believe we talked about this the last time we spoke. There have been now two pipeline projects. They're shown actually in this picture. 
One is the South Jersey gas pipeline, which is down here where I'm moving my mouse. And the other is the New Jersey gas pipeline, which runs through the blue here is Fort Dix, the mega base. These pipelines are not permitted by Pinelands rules, and yet the State Pinelands Commission, unfortunately, due to appointments of commissioners and the appointments of executive directors, have not been willing to take a stand against some powerful forces that would like to see them developed. The South Jersey gas pipeline ultimately failed, but not because the Pinelands Commission denied it, because natural gas has not been the boon that it used to be, and the developer pulled out. The New Jersey natural gas pipeline, unfortunately, had several, um, during COVID, several um, elements of that project failed. One ended up in the condemnation of a woman's house in Upper Freehold when underground drilling cracked her foundation. And yet the Department of Environmental Protection did not do enough to find the, they have yet to find New Jersey natural gas. And nobody stopped the project long enough for the legal battles to play out. Other concerns are that we're not doing a good enough job taking care of the land or our water. So the first element is the Pylons Commissioners. Pylons Commissioners, the 15 people that I mentioned, are absolutely 100% the most critical element of keeping this place protected. The um, vacancies are not related to COVID. They are related to commissioners who have requested replacements who haven't had the opportunity to step down and who have stopped showing up to meetings. There are vacancies on the Pinelands Commission that have long existed that unfortunately have not been filled by the governor and due in part to a failure of action at the new, on the New Jersey Senate side. And there unfortunately hasn't been good strong leadership at the very top of the Pinelands Commission to guide that agency of volunteers with special backgrounds forward. And it is a real threat to the long-term survival of this very special place. It is really important, you know, a lot of people, and I don't know if any of you have had this experience, maybe you have thought about visiting the Pine Barrens, but knowing where to go or where to start can be difficult because it is not the same as a national park, right? There's no visitor center to go to that officially welcomes you to get you in there. Um, but it's also this, this trouble with off-road vehicles. It's something we see in other parts of the state. Um, you see some of the destructive aspects here of erosion. So this one down in the bottom where my coworker Jason is standing, this is the Forked River Mountains, which is one of the highest points in the Pine Barrens. And that is erosion. I mean, you see where the trees are here. And while this area was slightly lower years and years ago, because off-road vehicles drive through to get to the top over and over and over again, it has called a caused a tremendous amount of damage. And then it makes it a place that is not welcoming to visit in the first place. This is something that really makes me mad every time I really look at the numbers. So we talked about how vulnerable water is in the Pine Barrens and how critical it is to people who live in this region. And we know more and more with climate change, the impacts of water, saltwater intrusion, and all of those concerns. Um, in 2001, there was legislation passed by the state of New Jersey that directed the Pinelands Commission to assess the aquifer. What is the health of the aquifer? How much water can we take from the aquifer in different areas and still maintain its ecology? which is directly related to how much development we can permit in certain areas. Um, the legislation appropriated $5.5 million from the Water Supply Fund to prepare this assessment, which was done in cooperation with the DEP, Rutgers University, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the U.S. Ge Geological Survey. It took a very long time to complete this work and it took a lot of pressing. We were constantly advocating behind the scenes, bringing it up in public, reminding people that all this money had been appropriated and needed to be used. The studies were finally done. They even compiled a plan that made recommendations for changes to their rules and regulations to better protect the aquifer. Nothing has been done to implement these changes, these recommendations to have real discussions and move the process forward. And in our minds as an organization, and certainly for me as a resident of New Jersey, it is absolutely inexcusable that we have this information and we haven't taken action on it. Some of the reasons are, obviously, many of these things are complicated. They are difficult to work out. 
But still, in the end, this is water that we all depend on to survive, whether you live in southern New Jersey and it's the Pinelands, or you live in the northern part of the state and that's the Highlands region. It is our responsibility to take care of this. So water is here for me, for my kids, for their kids, and so on. So, you know, I've talked a little bit about why this all matters. Um, and it does matter. To me, there are many personal reasons. I think beauty in nature is an essential element of what my, makes my life better. This opportunity to uh, eat blueberries, which were cultivated first in the Pine Barrens by Elizabeth White and are a native fruit. Take your kids out and have places to enjoy that are beautiful. Exploring the mystery of these amazing plants, like up here, this one that looks like a, a uh, horsetail almost. This is the threadleaf sundew, which is a carnivorous plant. It catches flies in that sticky goo and digests them to survive. Or the white fringed orchid. Um, we have all these amazing plants like the pitcher plant, which is also carnivorous, and these opportunities to see beauty. But, you know, beyond that, the pine barrens, these one million acres, it protects New Jersey's coast. It protects Barnegat Bay and Grape Bay and the shore as far as water quality goes. It protects clams and fish and all these elements that we depend on to survive that matter to us because they matter to our parents. Maybe our grandparents uh, uh, farmed clams. You know, all of these things are really important. The Pine Barrens is this huge area, this huge carbon sink to address climate change. And New Jersey as a state is invested in making sure that we are prepared because we are so impacted by climate change. And if we don't protect our forests and our wetlands, then we really aren't doing things that are almost cost free compared to what we will face in the future if we don't take these steps. Protecting forests in areas in the Pine Barrens helps all those little communities with, their, with the impacts of flooding. Um, open space, you know, for physical and mental health, like I mentioned earlier, was certainly highlighted by COVID, but still, but matters even outside of that. We're doing a lot of work to help people with disabilities who have barriers to getting to the outdoors, to find ways to share information with them about how they can get out. I think it's a grand experiment. If you look up some of the pines, it's this grand, and the question is, Will balance human use of the Pine Barrens to protect or we, or we miss that opportunity? And we're really, I, I think, at a tipping point. We need to be able to be invested and determined to uphold the regulations to protect the special area and really make it a point of pride with the state of New Jersey. Um, so that's what I have today, and I'm, you know, more than happy to take questions and all that sort of good thing. And thank you so much. Thank you, Becky. So um, we'll take questions. Yes. yes. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, my question pertains to the pine bark beetle. Uh, I understand it had started to uh, infect the pine barrens. What's the status now? And is there any need to use uh, pesticides and would this impact the quality of the water if, if that happened? Right, yes. So the Southern Pine Bark Beetle has caused a lot of trouble in the Pine Barrens and in other places across the nation where it has thrived. Um, it hasn't been determined to be at the level of an infestation or a danger recently. Um, when I began at the Pinelands Preservation Alliance from like 2008 to about 2009, there were a lot of problems with the pine bark beetle and the Department of Environmental Protection had implemented some mitigation strategies, which involved some things that helped to um, stop the pine bark beetle from thriving and not use pesticides, which was really neat to see. And one of those elements, ironically enough, is finding infested trees and then um, cutting them down but leaving them. For some reason, the pine bark beetle could only grow, uh, move vertically. So when the tree was cut down, it was very limited in where it could go. And I just thought this was the coolest strategy. There was, I know that there are and there have been use of, uses of pesticides to control some of the um, infestations. At least recently, it hasn't been a problem, but 
our director of conservation science was talking about it. And it is a concern that as the climate warms, that we are going to have trouble with the pine bark beetle again. Thank you. Jim Glenn. Yes, I enjoyed your talk. My question relates to the off-road vehicles because I was, uh, I've was i read over time about how that's become more and more of a problem down there. And I wondered how much recently has been happening with meeting with groups of people who ride them and organizations that support them and trying to get their cooperation. Yes, yes, that is uh, a great question. There's a lot of information to share, but I'll try to keep it short. So. In 2015, the state of New Jersey did try to release what they called a map or a motorized access plan for Wharton State Forest as the first step in implementing something that could be done across the state of New Jersey. The state did not do a good job at releasing information in a way that people felt heard. And so there was a lot of pushback from the off-road vehicle community and that plan was withdrawn. It's taken a very long time. Uh, we have been working tirelessly behind the scenes. I feel like everything I write is about off-road vehicles and what we're trying to do, but um, there has been some movement. And yes, there are groups, and I understand this 100%, people who enjoy driving, who don't wanna be lumped in with the people who drive in places they shouldn't. Um, the state, actually Sean LaTourette, who is the acting commissioner of the DEP, was just on Radio Times two weeks ago, actually, talking about how there are some areas, wildlife management areas that the US Fish and Wildlife Service has closed entirely to the public because of off-road vehicle damage and some drowning hazards from these swimming areas that aren't staffed. Um, what the, the commissioner said was, there are a couple things they're doing now that we now have more confidence they're actually going to implement. One is they just released that they have finally increased the fines when people get caught violating the rules. The fine had been $75 if you were caught driving through a wetland. When we were on different that come into the Pinelands to ride and they just called it the ticket uh, for access. No big deal. They've increased that fine to $265 with vehicle impoundment. So we do believe that that is a really critical step the second part is that the state has finally launched uh, the beginning of a, a process to talk with groups. So adv advocacy groups like PPA and rider groups who want to spend time driving through the Pine Barrens because the plan is to actually release a permit system, which has made sense. They do it in states across our country from Pennsylvania to Alaska, that if you want to drive your four wheel drive vehicle in a state forest, you stop by the ranger station, you get your permit, and you're given a map that shows you where to go. So I do feel more confident that these things are going to happen. It is going to really depend on people continuing to push the state. We feel like they're finally taking these steps because we have harassed them and everybody who uh, we've helped reach out has harassed them relentlessly that they can't simply just put this under the rug and ignore it because there's so many vocal advocates who are actually, unfortunately, uh, pretty aggressive in their language about being able to, uh, to drive their off-road vehicles. So there's definitely some more movement at the regulatory level. And the Pinelands Commission and the Pinelands Preservation Alliance, we've been doing some studies in areas that we've erected barriers and gotten permission to do. And we're studying the amount of recovery time it takes for some of those plant systems. And we should have some of that information available soon to make a stronger case for the importance of these regulations getting passed. Hey, good, thank you. You're welcome. Rich Jager. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Becky. Uh, my question is about the, the aquifer. Uh, can you tell us how much water uh, is drawn from the aquifer to provide, I guess, mainly drinking water, but maybe other purposes. And and also, are there are there communities that are actually dependent on the aquifer for their their source of drinking and washing water? Um, uh, and and what uh, if it's that that important to those communities? Yes. 
yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, I don't have the number of gallons that are, are taken regularly from the aquifer for drinking water, but I could get that for you. I do know that the city of Hamilton is one example where they depend entirely on the aquifer for two things, for their drinking water and also as the means by which their water gets treated and released. And that community has had so many struggles over the years as they have had um, uh, their water treatment facility uh, was having a lot of trouble treating the water and then being able to release it in the ways that it could be done safely because there wasn't enough sort of capacity to handle that. And so Hamilton, in collaboration with us and with a grant from the William Penn Foundation, we began working on a water conservation program. They were able to get money to reimburse people for replacing items in their home that would help them conserve water or to do an assessment of their home, much like the energy audit, I think that Rich, you had mentioned from Doug's talk. Um, so they've made great progress in, in that effort in to conserve water and to use water more regularly. Um, one of the aspects of what we do is we monitor what's called a water allocation request. When a development is proposed, it has to be accompanied by the amount of water they think they are going to need for that development and those people living there. And so we have done studies based on the, the very expensive study the state did on withdrawal in certain regions, because that's the thing about the aquifer is it's huge. And it, it is underneath the entire Pine Barrens, plus a little bit outside of the boundary. The impacts are variable. If it's closer to the surface in a different area, you will be able to take less water out because you're going to impact the rivers running through there more quickly than the deeper parts of the aquifer, depending on where you are geologically. So we do have um, the capacity to monitor those requests. And then when we can see based on at least our scientific knowledge that there's a development request where the water allocation appears that it will severely impact the ecology, we'll bring that to the attention of the DEP and submit comments and go through that formal process. Our basic premise has always been that water should be treated like electricity. It, no, that water is right now treated like electricity. It's just a given. Like if you're going to build a house, of course somebody's going to have electricity. If you're going to build a house, of course somebody's going to have water. Instead, we really need to look at it, how much water is available here, and that determines what can be built here. And unfortunately, the way these processes work, it isn't, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, but we try to stay on top of the developments that are proposed and development is picking up now. It had been slow because of COVID and actually had been slow ever since the recession in 2008. So um, it'll be interesting to see where things go from here. Becky, thank you for a great talk and the great work that you and the Pinelands Alliance do. I've often had this question of in fiction, the Pinelands are a place where gangsters dump dead bodies. Is there any truth to this story? Right, I know. You know, I gave a talk to a women's group along the coast when I started in 2007. And I was waiting, they were having tea and breakfast. And I was nervous because I was new. So I was sort of standing off to the side of the podium with butterflies. And I heard these women at the table talking about the Sopranos episode and how mad they were that this was the reputation that New Jersey had. It is such an interesting myth that has perpetuated, and I think it's perpetuated for a couple reasons. First, the Pine Barrens just are notoriously difficult to get around once you get in the interior, right? So there is that element of mystery. And then we have the Jersey Devil. This is this story that has been around forever of a uh, half bat, half horse creature that lurks around at nighttime and scares people. And there's historical stories from the early 1800s, accounts that you can find in newspapers. And so I think that lends a lot of credence to the stories um, that people have or impressions people have. I think the Sopranos episode in particular has such legendary status that it's always probably gonna have this reputation. And then unfortunately, every once in a while, 
you hear a story about something happening in the Pine Barrens. I think that a lot of it is the history and the mystery. And I would encourage anyone, if you're interested in getting out in the Pine Barrens and you're looking for a resource, we have the only map. It's got the roads, it's got highlighted areas to visit, and it's called the Pinelands Adventures Map. And you can get it on our online store and explore for yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Al, for the question. Thank you. I have a quick question about the uh, the water chemistry. I mean, you mentioned that uh, that it's acidic down there, and um, I remember years ago, actually on a canoe trip on the Batstow River, and um, the water was dark. You know. Oh yes. And then I kind of talked to my friends who knew much more about this than me, and I looked it up, and and I was, you know, I found out there was tannins in the water. Now, of course, tannin is one of the components of tea. So, you know, it always seemed to me that the water in the Basto River is like weak tea. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, it's still pure, clean water, but I mean, this is the natural chemistry of the area. So um, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah. In fact, you, you read it in books from um, fiction to nonfiction that it's referred to as tea-colored water or cedar-colored water. Mm. Um, Pine Barrens water, because it's acidic, one of the things that inhibits is the growth of bacteria. And so one of the reasons why the water was valued uh, in earlier times was that it could be stored in barrels on ships and it wouldn't go bad or um, stale or have some element in it that would make people sick. Um, and so though it has this unique visual aspect that people would look at and perhaps feel like, well, how can you say this water is clean because it is this reddish color? It's actually completely opposite. Um, one of the things that happens in the Pine Bear is because the water is acidic, it helps to leach out tannins, like Paul was saying, from a lot of the plant material. And those tannins are reddish in color. Um, but the other element that I didn't, you know, certainly have time to mention is that there's iron in the water, in the sands of the, uh, of the Pine Barrens. So when you mix a, acidic water with this iron content, if you are going down a Pine Barrens River, you can find what's referred to as bog iron. So there's this um, tendency you, through a couple processes for iron to precipitate out into a much harder form. And I think that's just a, another fascinating story. It's directly related to the Revolutionary War. Um, cannonballs and um, sort of low grade products were made from the iron that was found in the Pine Barrens. Um, Batstow Iron Works was a target of um, the British during this time because it was a manufacturer of cannonballs and the like. Um, so it's, a, it's fascinating. And the fact that you can still find iron is, is a really neat thing as you take a trip in the Pine Barrens. <laughs> that's, that's fascinating. You know, I, I, have to, I have to read a comment that Ivan just put into the chat in case not everybody is reading their chat. <laughs> he, said, he says, the Soprano episode where he shoots the Russian hitman was filmed in the Wachung Reservation, even though exactly. it's not in the Pine Barrens. The Wachung Reservation is right where we are. <laughs> yes, yes. It's true. I wasn't going to mention that, but that is absolutely true. It wasn't even filmed in the Pine Barrens, but it had Pine Barrens have the mystery. So, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, one thing I'd like to mention real quick, Paul, if um, if you are interested in having uh, an experience in the Pine Barrens, but given the nature of things today and the distance, I would encourage you to go to our website. We are hosting on September 4th, Saturday, an event at our farmstead, but elements of it are going to be streamed virtually. At 8 p.m., we are featuring a film that's called The Pine Barrens. It's going to be shown in our barn with live music by a group called The Ruins of Friendship Orchestra, and it will be live streamed so that you could watch the film. I find this film absolutely transfixing. There's a young filmmaker from Philadelphia who has spent more than five years putting this film together. It is both a musical experience that really draws you in, as well as getting into the historic history, historic use of the Pine Barrens, the history of the Pine Barrens, and the struggles of current day cranberry farmers, for example. Um, it is just an incredible, 
experience. And if you have the opportunity and are interested, you can purchase a virtual ticket so that you can participate. And that ticket purchase helps support this filmmaker's work to keep promoting this film, which I think is one of those ways that we can raise awareness and support for protecting the Pine Barrens because people get to have an experience without having to drive two hours or more to get there. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I was. I just actually did a Google search and got directions because I'm wondering, you know, wh wh how much effort would it be for the for the old guard canoe can kayak group to go down and paddle on the Batstow River? Yeah, <laughs> and it well, is actually about an hour and forty eight minute drive from from where I am in Summit. So you know, yeah, that's a bit of a barrier. But it, it, you know, I remember doing it many many years ago with the. Uh, the Murray Hill Canoe Club, which is part of Bell Labs in the old days. And, uh, you know, what you remember is the wonderful time you had, not how long the trip was. Yeah. <laughs> and Paul, I would encourage you, if any of your people who coordinate the uh, trips, reach out to me if you would like to plan a trip oh. for 2022, because oh, I can uh, make arrangements so that you could have a guided trip at a time that's convenient for you nice. to get down there. Cause we know it's really far to go, but it would it'd be amazing if you were interested, I'd be more than willing to help. Thank you, thank you. We'll get on it. So meanwhile, Ron Hoke would like to say something else. Okay. Can, okay what? Am I unmuted? Yes. I can hear you, okay. Ron. Very good, very good. I'd just like to have, uh, follow up on this question of the drawdown rate. Uh, how stable is the inventory in the, in the aquifer now? Is it being depleted by uh, excessively high drawdown rates or, or is it stable? It, um, it depends on the location. We are seeing impacts, especially along the shore boundary. Um, there is the... Um, there is more of a struggle now with saltwater intrusion. So as we're taking water out of the aquifer, we're actually allowing saltwater to creep in further into the drinking water, which has been happening for a long time, but the rate has accelerated. Um, this is one of our struggles with the Pinelands Commission to answer that this question needs to be answered now. And there is information available, but the commission themselves, unfortunately, hasn't put an effort behind um, highlighting areas where development needs to be halted entirely because of the issue you're talking about. And so I'm afraid that there's a lot that isn't known in the current climate of development in the Pine Barrens, but it is an absolutely critical question to answer if we really are going to protect the aquifer. And we'll keep pressing on that. Thank you. I'd just also like to make a comment. There are some interesting books uh, written about the Pinelands, uh, and I, I, I read one. And I forget the name of the author, but uh, I, I would suggest anybody who's interested to Google and uh, see if they can find uh, access to some of these interesting books. Yes, we, um, we have an online store, and one of the things that we do is we carry all of those books that are kind of hard to find. Um, there's some great Pinelands history like Iron in the Pines and um, small towns in Southern New Jersey. So we carry the only field guides and a lot of the books on uh, Pinelands history and um, could definitely help with that too, if anyone is interested, yeah. And you've got to read John McPhee's The Pine Barrens if, uh, if you're at all interested. Thank you. you. Know that's the uh, conservation story. So John McPhee publishes his book, The Pine Barrens in 1964. He ends that book, one of the last paragraphs says that he highly doubts that the powers that be have the political will to organize in a way to protect the Pine Barrens. He spent all this time driving through areas and talking to people who live there and talking to decision makers and really felt that there was just no way this was gonna happen. Brendan Byrne played tennis with John McPhee. John McPhee, as he as Brendan Byrne becomes governor, hands in this book and says, you should read this. I, you know, I want to know what you think. Brendan Byrne gets to that last paragraph and he's mad. And he, then he plays tennis with John McPhee and he says, I'm going to prove you wrong. And you know what? He did. Brendan Byrne had the political will and the bravery to suspend development, which was protested by the courts 
allowing for the creation of the Pinelands Comprehensive Management Plan. Once the plan was approved, the moratorium on development was removed just before the court decision was made, which may have ruled that this was not an appropriate use of power. But at the time, if you didn't stop development and people knew that these changes might be coming, you could have run into a lot of problems. So that book, The Pine Barrens, I think is one of those other critical elements that led to its protection. So thanks for bringing up books. Thank you. Thank you. Rick Smith. Um, yes, Becky, thanks. A wonderful presentation. I'll mention I'm in, uh, I live in Newtown, Bucks County. And oh, all right. Yes, yeah, so we're, I'm sure you're familiar with the area. We're very lucky to have, I could walk right over to Tyler State Park, which is a great resource for the residents down here. Um, just if you'd comment on the dire situation out west with the forest fires, and the dangerously low water table levels. Do you think that's a cautionary tale for New Jersey, the East Coast, and more specifically the pine, you know, pine land, pine barrens? Right, yes. You know, and I've seen some newspaper articles every year. There's an article that comes out about the danger that's proposed in our very, really densely populated part of the world. Um, it isn't the same because we have so much more uh, water available and our rains are we're having the opposite problem where we are experiencing these torrential downpours i think all of us experienced that just recently that are due to climate change and then the flooding and so that does that is part of what helps mitigate this um, danger but i would agree that there is a very large danger because being able to manage the forest in a way that gives the state firefighters the chance to stop a fire is critical. Mm -hmm. And um, the funding for the Department of Environmental Protection has been at historic lows. Um, staffing and uh, the funding for programs around protecting water and forests and the like in New Jersey is at a low, it's, it's at a low rate. And we know that there are a lot of economic constraints on our state, just like many states across the nation. But if we're really going to do what we can to mitigate wildfire danger, there needs to be a good plan for ecological management of the forests and the pine barrens using mechanical means. There are ways to go in and um, do some forest management that aren't clear cuts. It's um, cutting down trees, leaving trees in areas, but creating clearings. Those clearings are absolutely critical if you're going to have a chance at stopping a fire. And so, yes, it is, a, it is, da it is absolutely a danger. Um, we are lucky that we do have more, uh, we have a wetter climate, but if we start to experience drought, like what California has experienced for decades now, it is going to be much, much more dangerous. Here. Thank you, Becky. Ed Atkin. Uh, Ed, I have to send you an onion request too, though. Okay, Ed, can you unmute? There. I'm unmuted now, right? Yes. Yep. Great. Getting, learning better technology. Are they, they doing any, I've, I've gone down to the Pinelands for some of your short courses when you had at Burlington Community College in Wilson Atlantic, I guess down in Wilson Atlantic County when you did some at Stockton. Are they doing any work with turtles down there now? I've also done kayaking down there from Somerset okay. County on the, I think Wading River, Somerset County Park Services runs trips down there. Okay, yeah. Um, so there are there's two real there's a really neat educational opportunity, and it's run by the State Pinelands Commission, which is not the Pinelands Preservation Alliance. And like what you mentioned, Ed, the um, Pinelands Short Course, they do one in the summer and they do one in March, and it has been held recently at Stockton University. Um, this year they did one in the summer out at White's Bog Village. It is an amazing opportunity to spend the day in the Pine Barrens, to listen to speakers in science, history, culture, to take field trips. It's really well done. Um, as far as the bog turtle goes, the bog turtle is um, an endangered species in New Jersey and needs a lot of protection. Um, I know that New Jersey Audubon has been doing a lot of work. In particular, they've been doing work with farmers. And one of the really neat stories that I came across was um, the land that's owned for the Cowtown Rodeo. And I don't know if you have heard or are familiar with the Cowtown Rodeo, but the 
people who own that property have been working with Audubon for a long time in making sure that they manage property for the bog turtle, um, which needs to have habitat available and clean water. And it's a, it's a really neat story. I should find the um, link to send your way. Um, but that, yeah, that's a, a, a really important, spe an important species, more on the outskirts of the pines. Yeah, I've also done the cranberry bog tours down the pine lands. Yes. Which I think they do that what, in the fall, right? Yeah, so cranberries are native fruit in the Pine Barrens, and one of the primary ways they're harvested is to flood the bog with water. Cranberry bogs, I mean, I would describe them as these sort of square open areas, and uh, they'll flood the cranberry bog with water and go in with equipment that shakes the berries loose, and it is the most visually attractive thing to see because all of a sudden all these bright red berries float to the surface. And you can see them harvesting. If you're interested in that, I would look at uh, White's Bog Village, which is a historic village in Brendan Burns State Forest. They often do cranberry tours. And there is um, a family farm called the Darlingtons. I think their company is Pine Barrens Native Fruits. They are uh, part of the family who has been in White's Bog since way back. They started the cranberry farms there. And they also do cranberry tours, and it is an amazing thing to see. If you drive south in the Pine Barrens towards Chatsworth in October, you will likely see uh, cranberry harvesting action happening. Yeah, we, we've been down there. We've also, the thing that you would want to you you've been a presenter at the, at Burlington Community College, correct? I haven't, but other of my coworkers have. Yeah, I've met, met. Yeah, I think that's where I've met some of the people down there. Uh-huh. Yep. There are great classes down there. Great. It's really good. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. So um, last chance to ask a question, everybody. And this is good timing. It's just about uh, it's just about 1130. So, Steve, let us hand the mic back to you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, Becky, your passion for the Pinelands is absolutely infectious. Thank you so much. And uh, your talk today has been uh, a real eye opener. Among other things, we learned that the uh, Pinelands is the uh, biggest open space uh, on the eastern seaboard between Maine and Florida. We, we learned about uh, prescribed burnings, and uh, I think we were surprised to learn that the acidity in the Pinelands falls somewhere between orange juice and black coffee. Uh, we really are in your debt, Becky, and also in the debt of the PPA. You are, uh, you're truly doing the Lord's work. And, and we thank you for that. Uh, you may remember from when you were here in 2019, we have two ways of thanking our speakers. And uh, I think you're about to see something appear on the screen. And uh, this is our certificate of appreciation. Uh, you will probably remember that uh, the orchid shown in the lower left-hand side of the certificate is there because in uh, 1930, when the Old Guard was founded, the city of Summit was uh, at the epicenter of the uh, nation's orchid growing and distribution industry. And so it was only natural that our founders would choose the orchid uh, as our oh, logo. Yeah. And uh, we, we give you that uh, certificate uh, with our thanks and, and with our appreciation. And the, uh, the second way we have of uh, thanking our speakers, uh, if we can uh, unmute everyone for a second, is, uh, is with the old guard salute. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. I really enjoy speaking with you. And if I can ever be of assistance with anything, please let me know. I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank, thank you so much. And we'll, we'll pass your invitation along to our trips and theater committee in terms of a possible visit. Excellent. And uh, thank you again, Becky. And